This week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. Head on over to patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast and subscribe today. Fans, founders, and insiders like you help us keep the Run, Eat, Drink podcast going. And we thank you for your support. This is Catherine Switzer, and you're listening to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. Welcome to the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We feature destination races from across the country. And after the race, we take you on a tour of the best local food and beverage to celebrate. So whether you are an elite runner or a back of the packer like us, you'll know the best places to accomplish, explore, and indulge on your next runcation. Welcome to episode 164 of the Runny Drink Podcast. I'm your host, Amy. And I am your co-host, Dana. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. We are happy to have you. I have to give a shout out before we go on. By all means. To one of our patrons, big supporter of the show, JoJo, because she was inspired to do a 5K at the... Uh, this past weekend Mm -hmm. in her hometown said there wasn't going to be a medal. She's just going to do it. We inspired her starting your couch to 5k program. Yay. And she walked away with a medal in her age group. I saw that. That is super cool. Although I I have a hard time believing I inspired anybody to run, but I'm glad to hear that I did. That's that's it. It's warms the cockles of my heart. The cockles of your heart. It does. Well, you you inspired JoJo to get out there and do a 5K. And you know what else is going to be inspiring on today's show? Do tell. The second part of our interview from Catherine Switzer. Yeah, yeah. She's kind of a big deal in racing. And she's a trailblazer. She's an icon. And we have the rest of that interview for all of you out there. Mm-hmm. And... This episode, timing worked out really well. You know, we we ended up postponing um, this particular episode for a week, and it worked out rather nicely because as this episode drops into the feed, we are on the cusp. We are getting ready to celebrate here in the U.S. Cinco de Mayo. Oh, yes. So it actually, this episode drops on May the 4th. And may the fourth be with you. And also with you, which is a... <laughs> you said you big Star Wars nerd. Unofficial... You know, I'm a nerd too. Unofficial Star Wars holiday here, but you know Cinco de Mayo is coming up as well. And we decided to pair this week's episode with foods that well, would be appropriate for the celebration of Cinco de Mayo, as well as beverage. Mm, and yes. we are featuring a restaurant here in Southwest Florida that in my opinion, is one of those that if you are coming down here to stay, it's a must go. And a great place to celebrate the second part of our interview with Catherine. Oh, 100%. And to celebrate all of those people, all of those amazing, heroic, and and inspirational figures who contributed to jeff's virtual get well card last week yes and we do want to thank everybody who has sent in well wishes whether that's a text a a email sending us video snippets or audio clips Mm. however you did that we cannot thank you enough i think that the digital get well card that we put up at runeatdrink.net slash jeff looks fantastic and we actually heard from the man himself he was very appreciative of that and is on the road to recovery and we just can't thank you all enough in the runcation nation as well as those heroes and those who inspire us as icons in the running community including Catherine switzer who submitted videos of well wishes for jeff absolutely so speaking of Catherine Switzer, yeah, she's going to be our run segment this week. I because mean, really, does it get any better? It doesn't. It doesn't get any better I, when you have someone like her 
And what I love about this week's portion of the conversation we had with her is that we got to ask her questions from our patrons Mm -hmm. as well as get into her organization, 261 Fearless. Yes. And talk food and beverage with her just a teeny little bit. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's get right into that and give everybody what they're waiting for in this week's episode. And that is part two of our interview with running icon, Catherine Switzer. When I finished the race, it was pretty anticlimactic because I had to go through the same barrage of questioning from from the angry press and officials. Mm. And by that time, I had already grown up. You know, I often say I started the Boston Marathon as a girl. And I finished it as a grown woman mm. because you do go through this lifetime. And I had, I had this whole, whole life plan, like suddenly, you know, in front of me, I didn't know what it looked like, but I knew what I needed to do. It was, uh, it was setting amazing. an example and paving the way for women to know that they could do it. But also I think that your story, especially for back of the Packers like me, who, you know, this, it's not, it's not the glory, it's the accomplishment. And it is seeing the world through running and the opportunities that it provides yeah. that, that you paved the way for. Well, it was, you know, I paved that way, but then it's, you have to then do something with it. You, you can't just do it, but then go home because nothing's going to happen then. But I had this more than opportunity to create something. I had, the re- I felt the responsibility. It's mm-hmm. another thing my parents always said to me, you know, you're going to start that sweetheart. You're going to better, better finish it. Mm-hmm. And so I felt, okay, I, I know how to do this. I kind of know what needs to be done. And, and that's became almost a business model. It was like, you know, start small, build your base, create something that, you know, you can do mm-hmm. and then learn from that. And I did. And then eventually by starting a small club, in Syracuse, New York, and going ahead and graduating from university, then go, getting carrying on with a master's degree in PR and training my brains out, mm-hmm. um, I, I decided I would do two things. One is to to become a better athlete. Mm. I had a big I had a big chip on my shoulder. If you want to know the truth, <laughs> Jock Semple for five years kept saying I could have walked it as fast as she ran it. And, um, and that irritated me. So we worked really hard and got women official at Boston in 72. Mm. But in the meantime, we myself and a lot of other women kept coming back there and running faster every year. Mm-hmm. And, and then when we met the men's qualifying time and did our legislative week, we were made official in 72. And then I decided to concentrate on becoming a really good athlete and seeing if I could. And that was fascinating. And I did eventually won New York, ran at yes. 251 at Boston. Oh, but under yeah, three I, hours. Oh my God. Yeah, that is yeah. mind blowing. Well, in Jimmy. those days, in those days, the three, three hours sort of separated the men from the boys. And so we felt we women felt it separated the girls from the women. And you want to run, run with the big dogs. You got to train hard. So and yeah. I was fa- I was fascinated physiologically because I'm not really very talented as as an athlete. You know, really, I mean, I, I ran like a lot of four hour marathons. And then I trained down to with just doing distance. I trained down to a 315 and that was just doing distance doing and running a lot of races. Yeah. But, but, and being able to get faster simply because I got stronger, but to get under, to get under 315 then started, it was amazing, amazing amount of intervals and repeat 400s, repeat 800s, repeat speed work, speed work, which people say they don't want to do, but boy, you get results. Yeah. And so if, if I, as a no talent, could run a 251, I could imagine how many people have talent and they don't even know it. See, that's the other thing. You don't know until you try. <laughs> you don't know until you try. We have a patron and her name is Joanne Blatchley. And she says to, to run a marathon, like I'm a half marathon girl, she says. I'm, I'm, a ha- I'm a half marathon woman. I don't know. I want to do it once. How would you, what advice would you give her, she asks, in changing from a, a half marathon to a full marathon, how would you change the training? And I think I that do, you're kind of answering it right there. Absolutely. I would say yeah. do the same thing you trained from getting from one mile to 13 miles. The body always remembers. So, you know, everybody here listening to the show remembers the first time you ran a 5K. And so they, when you did that first 5K, you're tired, right? 
all right. So then you went out and you said, okay, I'm going to train for 10K. And then you know, the next time you ran 6K and you got tired at 6K, but you didn't get tired at 5K. Mm. And then you ran 7K and you didn't get tired at 6K. You see? And, and so if she does her half marathon. So the next time she trains for a long run, she needs to run 14 miles. And then she's going to look back and say, hey, well, look, when I got to 13, I wasn't tired. But I got to 14, I was tired. Then 15 mm-hmm. miles, the same thing happens. Then you get up into the netherworld of 18 miles, 20 miles. And that's when the whole nutrition thing kicks in, where you really need to, to have fueled up to get past mm. the about 21 mile walk. Again, women are really good at this because we have a natural fuel source. So it's, mm. it's in a way easier for us. And she shouldn't be daunted. It's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's <Do> fascinating. You- <laughs> And another one of our patrons says, do you incorporate stretching and yoga into the routine? Do you find that beneficial in training? Absolutely. In fact, when I was getting ready to run Boston again in 2017 for my Ah. 50th anniversary run, which, by the way, was the happiest day of my life, I have to tell you. Was it? Um, It was. I'll I'll tell you about that experience. Yes. Oh, please. That's that's going to be book number four. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, it was it was astonishing. So I was training up for it. And I decided in, uh, in the last 30 or 40 years that certainly advice has changed. And I went to a couple of pros. And one, the one person I worked with said, okay, listen, we're going to put you on program here. I showed him my running program. I said, we're going to have you run every other day. And I screamed. I said, oh my God, I can't run every other day. I've got to run at least every day. I mean, I was used to running twice a day when I was a world-class mm. athlete. She said, no. You know, she said, what do you really honestly think you're going to run this in? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I'll be really lucky if I can run a 430. She said, right. Okay. So this is not about speed. Okay. This is about covering the distance again. Mm-hmm. So we're going to run every other day. And I did do some speed work, but basically then on the opposite days, it was core work and mm-hmm. pretty darn serious core work. And I got, it was planks, it was balance, it was weights, it was lunges, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of sort of Pilates yoga stuff that I do on my own. I, I would go to the gym, uh, oh, well, once every 10 days or so, just for sort of a top up with a, a guy to make sure I was doing it right. Mm-hmm. But I, I hate to go to gyms because I hate taking the time, the, the tw- 20 minutes to get there, park mm-hmm. the car. And the 20 minutes back, I could take that 40 minutes and have a hell of a workout. So I do everything at home with my own little weights. And sometimes if I don't have weights, if I'm in a motel or something, I just take bottles of wine. (laughs) Bottles of wine. Well, Willie, if you do enough repetitions and, you know, if the bottles are full anyway. (laughs) I I was going to say the key here is is that you lift them first. (laughs) <laughs> yes. before drinking and then them. celebrate <laughs> yes it is running eating and then drinking yeah <laughs> yeah so every every other day and then long long run on the weekend and and then the long run see the other thing that that i had to get my head around is that the long run was going to have to be four and five hours sometimes yeah because that's how long i had to be on my feet on the race mm-hmm. and I, and so some of those runs were very very long runs fortunately you know, I have uh, two really beautiful places to run, you know, up in the woods and on the mountaintops here in New Zealand, really spectacular in the Hudson Valley where I live as well. So I try to get off of the road for those and run on dirt. And I think that has really, really saved my legs, especially my knees. I, I've had no problems, knock wood, with my knees, little problems uh-huh. with back, but the impact is so much reduced. If you can be on a, a softer surface grass trail, dirt, something like that. So that was basically what you did to train, to run on the anniversary of your initial Boston run. Right. And it's a a routine I stick to now. Uh, Is it? Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. Every, every other day I run opposite days, a walk um, and core work. So let's talk about the happiest day of, of your life of your running okay. life. Let's talk about the anniversary run at Boston. Well, as bad as 67 was, you know, with all the negativity. All right. Imagine then 50 years later running Boston 2017 and the field is essentially 50-50. It was 49% women, 51% men. So, you know, we'd reached equality. Mm. But, mm. And, and that having been the only woman wearing a bib in 1967 to then in 2017, 50 years later, 
being surrounded by 13,500 women wearing a bib was incredible. Really, it was, it brought tears to your eyes just to even think of it. And instead of people on the uh, spectators shouting things like, you should be home in the kitchen making dinner for your husband, like they shouted in 67. Oh, they were nice things too. Don't get me wrong, but some really crappy things uh, yeah. in 67, but laughable. I mean, when somebody shouts, you should be home making dinner for your husband. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you laugh? You burst out laughing. Anyway, to people shouting, go women, go 261. They had huge s- signs that they held up that said 261, go women, go Catherine. And they were all, they all knew the story. You know, they all knew the story. And it was a wonderful anniversary. And then I, I stopped 13 times. I, I hugged, I hugged everybody along the way. I, you know, hugged and kissed more kids. I did eight interviews and I still ran only 24 minutes slower than I did in, in 50 years before. So it was from the point of view of running, it was really good. I ran negative splits. I ran really perfectly paced marathon, but the best of course was coming down Boylston street, you know, to look down at that finish line and see waiting for me, Joanne Flaminio, who is the first woman president of the Boston Athletic Association in 135 years. Wow. And she's holding my medal, right? Like oh. this. And, and my husband alongside. And I, I don't know about you, Amy, but I always ha- have had this romantic fantasy, you know, that, that you cross the finish line in glory and that your lover is waiting for you and you give, have this big embracing kiss. And so we did. <laughs> <laughs> right there on network TV. So I didn't care. <laughs> it was great. Oh, I mean, who cares? It's such a spectacular moment and, and such a moment in time and, and yeah. such an honor of, of the anniversary. And I will tell you, I, you are right. I know we, we have a tradition. Dana could run incredibly fast. He can run faster than I can, but he always stays with me. And when we cross the finish line, one of the greatest things I'll always take away from any race that we run together will be putting the medals around each other's necks and having the the photographers capture moments like that, like you talk about, because and there are so many moments along the way on on the course in in races where, you know, runners are just some of the best and nicest people that you'll ever meet, never having known them before on the course or in groups now with the way that we do virtual races because of COVID and the pandemic. It's, it's, yeah. And uh, we connect in, in ways that we haven't before. Yeah. We've said uh, numerous times that some of the nicest people we've never met are runners. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I say, you know, um, in particular, um, after this, after Boston in, in 17, mm-hmm. later in November, I decided I was on a roll. I might as well run New York. I hadn't <gasps> run through the streets, you know, in 43 years and, Yay. and it would be great. So, but you might recall that four days before the race, they, there was that terrorist attack on the West, uh, West side highway mm-hmm. where the guy drove the truck into the cyclists and the runners and killed those people. Well, right. they almost had to cancel the race because, you know, they, they viewed it as a terrorist attack. And, um, oh, my God, the press, the phone was going like crazy. You can't you shouldn't do this, Catherine. You know, you, it's dangerous. And, mm. and I said, you know, I'm going to be running with 55,000 people. And I said, I know very few of them. And, and the guy on my left, the imaginary guy on my left is a different color from me. He doesn't speak English. And the person on my right, I don't know their gender and, and they don't speak English either. Mm-hmm. But we're going to run 26.2 miles together. Yeah. And we don't care about your religion, your color, your gender, your income, your weight, your time. We are going to be motivating each other and we're going to hug each other at the finish. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with sex or violence. Right. You know, um, and I said, this is the most inclusionary, diverse uh, egalitarian and respectful activity, you know, I know of, and I think Mm -hmm. it's a great global example. Absolutely. When you're out there on the course, one of our patrons, Kristen Seneviva, I mean, she, she says, when you hit a wall, how do you find the spark again? Is it in those other runners? Is it? Boy, 
I tell you, when you hit the wall, it depends on how you hit the wall. Sometimes yeah. you hit the wall and man, it is gone. OK, it is so, yeah. so gone. And it is a torture. It really is. And in that case, I would strictly recommend that you um, rely on the friendship around you and plenty of other people are going to be hitting the wall. Um, you start drinking as much nutrition drink or uh, get an energy bar in you, whatever you can. Mm -hmm. um, but start walking and walk, jog, walk, jog to the finish because it's going to be faster than dropping out of the race. But yeah, the, the company of strangers who are the best friends you never met. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are, are they are phenomenal. They'll, it can lift they'll you tell up. you stories and lift yeah. you up. Yeah. 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 So what, and our, 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 another patron asks Jennifer Hall, she says, what is your best piece of running advice? Well, my best piece of running advice is to, to do it regularly, to be consistent about it. Consistent. Consistency is always more important than speed mm -hmm. or, even a, or even a long run once a week. I would say it's much more important to get out there for 30, 40 minutes an hour if you can, mm. um, you know, several times a week rather than just once a week or um, thinking you could do it all at once or going out and doing it really fast. Consistency is always more important than anything else. Also, I mean, in terms of, of women, again, women are always worried about their weight. Um, that is mm -hmm. the most consistent thing in terms of calorie burn as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, you, you know what, you know what it's like. You can eat more. Uh, of course. You can, eat, you can eat less. You can eat less or you can burn more. And um, if you just keep that, that caloric expenditure going, you keep the metabolism up, mm -hmm. you keep it, you keep, the body in a, in a revving motion and keeping the, the caloric burn. Before we depart the running segment of our show, mm -hmm. and we ask you a very important eating and drinking question, well, two of them, but you, you paved the way for women in running. You made it possible for Joan Benoit Samuelson to have that gold medal performance in 84 in LA. And that is a, just watching documentaries about that. Just, I will watch them anytime and every time they are on television and he, he can't do anything about it. So <laughs> that well, is, he's, he'll watch them too. <laughs> oh yeah, actually I do. And, and your book has accompanied us on more than one drive to a race. Yes. So I'm, yes. I'm so, right there. The but after your anniversary run in Boston, I think it would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the launch of your organization of 261 Fearless. And oh, because good. I think that would mean a lot to the members of our Runcation Nation who are looking at running and thinking, how do I do this? I'm back of the pack. I'm heavier. I can't. Everybody has told me my knees are bad. I can't do it. And I want to do it. I, I think that if people know about this organization and what it does, that, that that could inspire and help them. So can you talk about that? Yeah, actually. I'm, and then I was just leading into that. And, you know, when I was telling you about how wonderful I'm looking for the company bid to this. Hold on, where did it go? Um, well, darn. Okay, um, there it is. Um, two six one fearless. Okay, there you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and, and and my shirt isn't that cool? Two six one fearless. Fearless forward. Fearless yeah. forward. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, about six years ago, all of a sudden, 261 became a number meaning fearless in the face of adversity. And it, it, it came to us. It just people were tattooing it. They were inking their arms. They were wearing it in a race. And they all kept using the word it makes me feel fearless. And so we said, mm. what are we going to do with this? Um, and we've got to do something because everybody's relating to being told you're not good enough and you can't do it. You don't belong. You're the wrong color or race mm. or, or you're, you're not cute. You don't belong, whatever. OK. And we decided that that. Um, after the getting the women's marathon in the Olympic games, 1984, that's great for women who have the opportunity, let's say to train and to, to succeed as a, as athletes. What about the ordinary woman? M most of whom are fearful and have no opportunities. What can we do for them to get them? So they too feel fearless and empowered. And we realized, Hey, listen, running is so easy and cheap and accessible to everybody. Let's create local clubs where mm. any woman, regardless of her background, uh, in a totally non-judgmental and non-competitive environment can come learn to walk, run with us in, in a safe community. Mm. And we backed it up also with good training and educational programs. And a series of clubs each have a trained club, a coach, 
mm-hmm. and a group director, um, almost like Girls on the Run for grown women. Yeah. And but but to take that woman and literally by the hand and say, come on, we're going to take the first step together. You can do this. And they they, they come out and they find that they have a fun community mm. that everybody is is very, very kind and good to them. Um, and then they they run that first mile uh, and they say, oh, my God, I never thought I could do that. And then, of course, that becomes five, becomes 10. Uh, and if they want to go then run a marathon and become competitive, then there are plenty of clubs they can join. And now they have the kind of courage to do that. But mm. more importantly, the sense of empowerment spills over into their lives where they start commanding respect, even in their own family, you know, getting time for themselves taking time for their health and their wellness and their movement, feeling good about themselves, having that victory under their belt that nobody can take away from them, go back, finish an education, um, start uh, being a leader in the club, creating their own nonprofit business with the club um, or um, doing, asking for a raise at work, leave a bad relationship, whatever it takes, you know, then now they're, they're empowered to choose their own destiny a lot. It is so that's that's what the goal is and in the marathon simply, of life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So people can go to two six one fearless dot org. They can join us. We're, we have some wonderful programs coming up right now. Move the world. We're launching yeah. tomorrow. Um, you know, you don't have to to be in a race. You can do this virtually with us. Get your medal. I was just showing off my medals in the stuff from the move the world last year. We oh, have all oh, these medals yeah. from all these different events. So we virtually supported those events mm-hmm. um, and the medals were mailed to you. And it was really cool. We're going to uh, be doing a Facebook live in fact tomorrow and oh. uh, with Boston buddies. Yeah. And announce that program with them as well. And on April 19th, we're going to have a live zoom, which people can join if they want to move the world with us. And, um, and I'll be there talking to them. Uh, so we, we have virtual workouts year round. Um, we then of course, once the, the doors open in all these countries from the pandemic, we will begin meeting in person again. Mm. Um, and, but here in New Zealand, you know, <laughs> we're already meeting yeah. in person. Yeah. I believe that it will happen. It's it will a wonderful happen. organization. Yes. We we're only four years old and we're in five continents in 12 countries. And we would really welcome you to join us. It's, it's more yeah. than just meet, run and have coffee. It's mm-hmm. also, it's also an opportunity for women to take a leadership role. In, in their community as well. But, but if you're not up for that, we'll, we'll, we'll make you feel empowered. That's for sure. <laughs> we will, we will link to that so that uh, anybody in the Runcation Nation can find out more about it. Yeah. And I heard 261fearless.org. Yeah. That is that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Org, dot org, O-R-G. Mm-hmm. And that's right. Amy, this, what did you hear? 261fearless.org. 261fearless.org. I just want to make sure that we had that right. <laughs> right. I see what you're doing. <laughs> we have, we have three questions. Uh, as we wrap, uh, wrap up our, our interview, it, it, this is the eating segment of our show. And we could talk about eating all day long. We run so that we can see the world and then eat and drink local food and beverage that kind of celebrates that community. Um, anywhere you've run or in your hometown where, well, any one of your hometowns throughout your life, what is your favorite post-race meal for celebrating and indulging after you have accomplished your goal? Absolutely. My favorite meal after, after I've accomplished my goal is a very cold and very big beer. Um, and you usually, liked her. <laughs> and usually a, um, well, that's, it's very nutritious. Beer is very nutritious actually. Um, and usually some a big piece of protein. So a steak, especially oh, yes. um, maybe a heavy fish, but Usually a steak or if I'm in Germany, like a Wiener schnitzel or something oh. like that. Um, but but yeah, so get some protein in there because I've mm-hmm. been carving. I've been carving yeah. up now for a couple of days before that. Is there a specific place like a, a, a restaurant or a bar where you go to where, where if you could be anywhere, if you could transport yourself anywhere to have that meal, where would it be? In my house. In your house. So you would make it at home. <laughs> I would make it at home and I would yeah. have all my friends over. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. And what kind of beer? If we're talking now, we're launching into the drink launching segment, the drink yeah, segment right here all at once. Well, you meal. know, now that's a tricky one because you, yeah. Yeah, I need I need to go to a pub that has a real 
a real pull. So yeah, that's that's really critical. You know, tap beer is much better than bottled beer. And if you're in New Zealand, bottled beer isn't too bad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, I, you guys are great. I can't oh, tell you what an honor and pleasure it's been. Thank you so much for taking the time. Love you guys. She's so inspirational. And she was so kind in the wrap up of, of the chat we had with her. She was. She's, you know, you know, when I get to that point in my life, I think I'm going to just kick back and relax. Man, she doesn't let any, any you know, grass grow under her feet. No, no <laughs> running pun intended there. She's a busy woman. And just... She's uh, inspiring and motivating others. It's just like she said at the outset of this second part of her interview. You got to do something with it. You can't just... Go be the first woman to run Boston officially and then go home True, and sit on it because then nothing will happen. And I I think that she has done an excellent job of using that momentum to carry her mission forward. And it really is, is amazing to think how far running in general and women's running specifically has come in such Mm. a short amount of time. And we link in the show notes to not only her book, but also to the organization 261fearless.org. Yes. And we encourage you all to check out those resources. I mean, it's called Marathon Woman, but it has stories, inspiring and and humorous. And those stories transcend gender. Yes. I, I mean, I, I've listened to the book with Amy in the car, and I, you, you're not going to go wrong. It's a yeah. great book. Yeah. I, and we can't thank her enough for taking time to talk with us on the show. But now that we have talked to a running icon and we have been doing some training ourselves and, and getting back out moving and, you know, the, the heat is building here in Southwest Florida. Indeed. As, as our training runs are now starting to feel much more summer-like. Let's, so much more human. Yeah. Mm. You know, we've accomplished some training runs. You've been moving and doing the Amy Shuffle, the hashtag Amy Shuffle, as exactly. our patron Josh would say. Indeed. We have to explore some local food to round that out. And celebrate having Catherine on the show. Having Catherine on the show and celebrate all you guys for your well wishes for Jeff, like we said at the exactly. top of the show. And It's we, amazing the way the community comes together and... That is worth celebrating. We have always said some of the nicest people you'll ever meet, you've never met. And it's people in the running community. You've met them virtually. You only meet them virtually. Yeah. So. But hopefully we will meet you in person really soon. Yeah. That's a, that's a goal for, for this coming year. But mm-hmm. in the meantime, we wanted to feature a restaurant here in Southwest Florida that is, in my opinion, like I said, at the top of the show, a must go if you're vacationing down here so if you're if you are deciding you're going to get some sun and fun in your summer and you're going to be down in southwest florida say the beaches of sanibel fort myers beach if you're going to be down in the resorts of estero or naples Mm. or maybe you're getting a summer rental here in cape coral which a lot of people do to take in some of the amazing boating that we have with our 400 miles of canals that we have here in the city, Mexico Lindo mm. is a eatery in Cape Coral that I think is a top-notch Mexican restaurant that combines, a, it does a great job at combining authentic Mexican flavors with some Americanized Tex-Mex touches that really leaves you stuffed and satisfied and wanting to come back for more in my humble opinion i agree with you 100 percent. the building is a big yellow building so if you come to our hometown you will not be able to miss it no you can't and when you come in the decor just transports you and gets you ready to have that amazing and delicious meal yeah, right down to the stitch work on the chairs at the bar. 
I love the bar and the chairs at the bar are, I think they're unique. They're very unique and they've, they've got, you know, great custom embroidery on the back of the chairs, on the back of the banquettes. The artwork, like the artwork mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. On the back of the chairs all throughout the restaurant. They Just do gorgeous. An amazing job with the decor. The staff has one of the longest tenured wait staffs that I think that we've seen at a restaurant in Southwest Florida. It's one of the longest that we we have ever seen. Yes. And I truly do enjoy their musical offerings during the weekend. Oh yeah. They have an out live mariachi. And it's, he's fantastic because he'll talk to you and then he'll, he'll, sing to you and, and then he'll turn around and sing to me and say this is from him to you and it's just yeah guys he does some he's of the got work the for touch you. he he's knows how to work touch. the crowd he's great and he does traditional mexican songs yes. as well as modern songs mm-hmm. with a, and and kind of puts a little mariachi flair i don't know if this is reminding anybody of a favorite mexican restaurant in their hometown I hope so. I really do hope so because everybody should have a restaurant like this in their hometown. Yeah. Now this is, there are different types of Mexican that you can get. You know, you can go and you can get Mexican street food and you know, you're talking typically Mexican street food, you know, is, is very inexpensive, big portions, um, depending on where you get it cooked, very flavorful, but it's not the prettiest thing to look at oftentimes it's it's you know made to kind of eat on the go and you know it's well there's something to be said for a good taco truck oh 100 percent. and and what i was what what i mean though is this is while they have some items on the menu that are like that right they also have some elevated items as well so you get a little bit of an elevated mexican experience Mm. at this place that is what I mean by it. it is a place that I think of when I think of where are we going to celebrate moments? Yes. Like crossing a finish line, like the whole of our community coming together for Jeff, like a major accomplishment or milestone. Mm-hmm. This is one of those places. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is one of the places that during the height of the pandemic, we made sure to order from on a pretty regular basis because we, sure. we wanted to do our best to support them. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't regret it. Food quality has not suffered one bit. We have had food in the restaurant and to go as well. And they have veggie menu too. They do. I mean, sure we do. indulged in this particular meal that we're going to talk about, but they have uh, veggie dishes so you could perfectly well walk the line if you needed to or yeah. wanted to. Yeah, we walked right over that line. And let's, let's talk about that. I mean, although you could say that the first item that we had as an appetizer is on the line. It's, it's, it's walk in the line. <laughs> we, you, do you want to start? Table side guacamole, people. Love the show. Love the guacamole even more. It's eight. And when you say show, you're talking about the tableside show. I, yes, it's called tableside guacamole for a reason. Yes. They bring it all on a tray, and they have the diced red onion, the diced tomato, the diced jalapeno. They have the mixture of warm spices. They have limes, fresh avocado, and they ask you beforehand, what would you like to have mixed in? So if you have somebody at the table who is a little bit leery of spice, then you can always say, hey, I just want this little bowl of diced jalapeno on the side. Exactly. Or if it's you and it's me, we're just throw it all. Absolutely. In there together. Bring it. Bring it on. And then there's cilantro too, in addition to those warm spices like cumin. I don't know if you say cumin or cumin. Tomato, tomato, I think. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying to you, though. Mm-hmm. But all like it, it, all those warm spices, they're all mixed together so well. And the avocado is so fresh. And the chips that are served at your table are warm. Oh, they're, they're frying 
tortillas back there all night long. And and unlimited. Salted perfectly. And did I mention unlimited? Unlimited. Yeah. Unlimited. So I guess the, the temptation or the tip is you, you have to use them judiciously so that you can enjoy the entree and you don't fill up on them. That's hard for me to do. That That is my kryptonite when I go to a Mexican restaurant. If there's a, a basket of chips, it's an immediate thing that I just start snacking on those and I, I just keep going. I mean, I, I can't not I, I mean, we eat kept, the chips. We, we kept going. We shared a basket of chips for not only guacamole, which was so flavorful and... You know, I was going to say that I like about this one. What? Um, what I really like about this, and we've we've had this several times. This oh, yeah. is this is a staple for us. Yeah. You go there, and they'll bring out the the avocados, and they cut the avocados right there. And I've seen it happen before, where maybe the avocado is a little too ripe. Mm-hmm. They don't use it. They go mm-hmm. get another. Yeah. Or if it's underripe, mm-hmm. and in that case, what ends up happening is the avocado is really too firm to mash. Yeah. And you also don't get a lot of the meat inside of the avocado. Mm. So they'll also take it back. So they do a pretty good job. I've seen it happen once or twice. Quality control. But they do it instantly right there with you there. So when you're done, you get the perfect bright green Mm. guac. Mm. And they use red onion. I love red onion in guacamole. It makes all the difference. I think that if you're doing guacamole, it cries out for a little bit of color. Number and one. it's a different kind of bite in that onion. Yes. It, it doesn't have the sharpness of a, of a yellow onion. And it doesn't have the, um, what would you call it? Not so much heat, but... but bite. The, yeah, like the bite of, like, the a, bite of a, white, like a white Spanish onion. It's different. The bite is it's different. It's milder. And again, that, that red color is just so perfect. Mm. Of course, you can opt to leave the cilantro out if you want to, but we all, we all know my stance on cilantro. Everything there is entirely optional, and they ask you. They do. So that's made, and I mean, it was big enough for, there, were, there was us and one of our patrons mm-hmm. dining out. We yes. had the opportunity to meet up with patron of the show, one of the original patrons of the show, yeah, John Schroeder. Mm. And so big enough for three people to split, no problem. Yeah, but then we also opted to try something a little a little more savory to to counterbalance the guacamole, and we went with their, counterbalance the guacamole. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we went with their white queso dip, and we added chorizo to it. Mm. And this is their by their own admission a secret recipe of white cheeses, mm. and this by itself is silky it is it is it it is an easy dip it it actually holds up or doesn't get really firm as it starts to cool off so it maintains its dippiness yeah that's true if it makes any sense yeah um but when you add crumbled chorizo to it Mm. you you get the the creaminess and the saltiness of the cheese and then you get the meatiness and the spiciness of the crumbled chorizo oh but it's not overly spicy if somebody is looking at that oh, not heat. you're right and thinking oh it's too much i can't you know i think of your mom oh she wouldn't she 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 did like chorizo she would eat this she would not eat the jalapenos and the guacamole but there are different levels of spice on chorizo sometimes and I just, this particular chorizo that comes to the table as a part of this dip mm-hmm. is totally doable. Oh, yeah. It is a warming heat. It is not. I'd even argue it's not even hot. I, it, the spice that they use, they, yeah. they're using things like smoked paprika, cumin, uh, chili powder, it's garlic. Warming. Yeah, it's it's super flavorful, though. The layers of flavor is where the warmth comes from. So, yes, just yes. But it is a high co- fat content uh, pork sausage. Of course. So you know it. The, again, this was an indulgence meal. Uh, it was. So you know we understand that. And boy, did we indulge! And you get you know that something that I like about it is you get a little bit of the orange. Um, 
the, the orange color in the fat as it renders out. Oh yes. And yeah. you know, that mixes in, into the chorizo or into the, uh, into the, the queso cheese. dip. Yes. Oh, it's so tasty. Oh, it's, it's really, really good. But that was just, that was how the three of us started our meal. Uh huh. And we're going to feature two of the entrees tonight. But by no means is that all. Oh no. They're, they're, Menu is have. quite varied. Oh. And you can go from items just to, uh, right around 10 bucks. Maybe a little less, actually. Maybe a little bit less when you yeah. start getting some of your tacos. Mm -hmm. um, all the way up to, I want to say, the, like the, one of the more expensive items on the menu is about 26 or $28. And that is one Oh, of their, I went for it. That's one of their molcajetes, which is this giant lava rock bowl that's just chock full of, yeah, and you can pick surf or turf, and it's chock uh. full of either land land based meats or sea based meats. And uh, a delicious sauce, and it's it comes out just bubbling hot, and that bowl is at like five hundred degrees when it comes to the table. So good. So that's one of their pricier items. I went with something a little bit uh, low to mid range. Yeah, you were in the middle. And this is their beef tamales. For fourteen ninety nine, you get three fresh made beef tamales topped with a combination of their red chili and white queso sauce. And they serve this with their Spanish rice and black beans. Now, this week's episode artwork is not going to have food pictures in it. No. But you are going to be sharing photos from... Yeah, because we wanted to feature 261 Fearless. Yeah, and it's all about Catherine. The, the day in particular that she came back to Boston, the anniversary. But I will post pictures because you will feast with your eyes. You really will. Guaranteed. These quesos, each one of them is about the size of, oh gosh, maybe almost two decks of cards in terms of length and thickness. And, you know, th these just had the most amazing spiced ground beef inside. Mm. And the masa was the perfect texture. You know, they, they steam them in, in the corn wrapper. Mm -hmm. They bring them out to you unwrapped, which is very nice. And then they, and then they sauce them. But tamales done right are just amazing. You get that masa, that corn flour that's steamed, and it's almost like this dumpling wrapping around whatever the protein is in the middle. And in my case, it was beef. They do offer you options for chicken mm -hmm. as well. But, oh, so you get that. So you get that, that amazing corn flavor. You get that beefiness from the meat. And then that combination of their red chili sauce with the, the white queso mixed into it gives you just this elevated, punched up, uh, cheesy, spicy, uh, tomato-y kind of, mm, it's so good. So good. And their their black beans are phenomenal. I, I'm a black bean fiend. I eat them all the time. And it's the red Spanish, uh, <laughs> the red Mexican rice. Yes. Say. Yeah. So reddish, reddish, yellowish. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's just got great flavor. And I mean, you get a little bit of each, you know, a little bite of everything together. Make that perfect bite on your fork. Oh. Uh, it's heavenly. They also give you a little dollop of sour cream, a little dollop of, of pre-made guacamole. And you have pico, don't you? And some, too? Pi and some pico de gallo, if mm. you like that. So I, I couldn't eat my entire entree, needless to say. I got through a little over two of the tamales. Mm. And uh, I, I regret nothing. I regret nothing. Well, I enjoyed everything about mine <laughs> which is a ribeye a la mexicana oh. and it's on the pricier side so it's more indulgent mm -hmm. it's ribeye so you know you're gonna pay a little bit extra for that quality of beef the cut and of beef. fat and just it is cooked to order and I got mine medium rare, but you can do it any temperature they ask. Okay. So the ribeye a la Mexicana. Certified chunks of Angus beef mixed with mushrooms cooked in Mexico Lindo sauce, which I had to ask about the first time I ever had it. It's made of tomatoes, onions, and green peppers and served with rice and black beans. 
the same rice and black beans you had with your tamales. Mm -hmm. But what I loved about our server this time is she said, do you want tortillas? It really is. It cries out for tortillas. It does. Because it's chunks of this ribeye. And you can tell that they've been grilled to perfection because they have the grill marks. And then you have the peppers and the onions and the tomato and the sauce, the red sauce that is just warm. So now some people might be thinking that this is like a steak with sauce on top. It's not. It's No. It's... How would you describe the appearance of it? Like it's it's chunks, like almost in a sl- smothered in the stew, like the the sauce. Yes, yeah. I would say it's it's not a soup. It's not a stew. It is chunks of the steak that are that are huge. They are. They're very robust, and slices of onion you can see slice thick slices of bell pepper you can see mushrooms that are just about the same size as the chunks of beef yeah i love that and the sauce it's just it's tomato sauce it's not it doesn't need a bowl okay it's not that side of stew or or soup right. it is just enough sauce so that you can put it on a tortilla have a little bit of the pico and the guac that came with and maybe a little bit of rice in there or some beans and you just you get a little bit of guac maybe this you roll it up and it's just warm tomato and meaty Beefy magic. <laughs> this is one you've had before. The meat is tender. It is not tough in any way. I would have this again and again at this place. And that's not to say their fajitas are awesome. The mocajete, awesome. Awesome. They also do a pork version of this that I had the last time we went. Oh, the chili verde. They call it a chili verde. It's the same type of thing. It's chunks of pork. With that the are green sauce that are done with it, yeah. Instead of the beef with the red, they do this with a tomatillo sal- salsa, which was awesome. And I honestly, it, I always have a hard time deciding. It comes with potatoes that one, and I was feeling instead more of mushrooms, the mushroom, onion, pepper, and rice kind of together. You wanted that umami bomb. Mm-hmm. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that, but I'm normally my favorite and my preference is tomatillo. So, but this does not disappoint. It is magical. It's huge too. It's huge. I took half of it home and uh, it is a celebratory dish that is worth it. Every bite is amazing. Yeah. And we, these are just the things that we're talking about. Our friend John had an amazing looking chimichanga. We have had their street tacos in the past. We have had the mocajetes. We have had, really, we've tasted our way around that menu. And they, and they do an amazing tres leches cake with mango <gasps> that if I had remembered. <laughs> that we, we should have taken home. We should have taken home. Yeah. I, I didn't remember it because I was so full. I'm like, I can't eat anything else. But then if I'd have gone, oh, they have dessert here. Should have grabbed it's it. It's delightful. It really is. And you don't really go for mango all that much. I typically do not. I won't eat mango by itself. I will but, eat it in things. But this was just creamy caramel mango kind of just... But their flan is really good too. It is. I'm not going to lie. So we are giving you this location. This is one of those secrets that the Costin household... Love it. Loves. The natives in the area love this place. It was, I mean, when they started to serve again after the pandemic. The height of the pandemic. The height of the pandemic. I can tell you that it was just like. They were flooded. Everybody flocked to this place. So. Yep. It's worth it. 100%. We're going to have a link in the show notes to their website. Of course. Check them out. Mexico Lindo of Cape Coral, Florida. And if you come, give us a call because we'll meet you. We'll there. meet you there. <laughs> Absolutely. But we're going we have a, a 
drink to talk about from we there do. as well. But before we go on, we want to say thank you to all of our patrons for the support and growth that you guys have allowed us to achieve. You've helped us so much we can't even express it. Your contribution each month continues to help us bring you a great show here in 2021. And helps us back it up, too. I, most, oh, re- yeah. I, most recently, oh. I was able to get a new backup hard drive thanks to you guys. And it's up and running. And chances are good that if we have a, a critical failure here, you guys are going to save us. So thank you. Exactly, exactly. And as we hear more and more about live races returning and those members of our Runcation Nation making plans, you all will make it possible for us to resume Runcations and plan our first ever Runcation Nation meetup. At patreon.com slash run, eat, drink podcast. We currently have three different levels of monthly support, $2, $5, and $10. And each of those levels have their own special perks that we're continuing to add to and refine here in 2021 to make them the best possible perks that you could possibly get from a patronage program. Patrons get a special thank you message from us. I spent, uh, I sent two of them off this past week to two of our newer patrons. Insiders get a look behind the scenes, get access to video footage and early access to special interviews, cooking demos, exclusive tastings of our favorite food and beverage, including bonus items from places that did not make it into the show. The show itself is always going to be free, but if you want more Run, Eat, Drink podcast content and you want to support us long-term, check us out patreon.com slash run eat drink podcast or if you use podbean tap on the reward button at the right side of the top of the podbean app to become a patron all the same perks and levels are right there in the podbean app as always we thank everyone for every way you support the run eat drink podcast now let's talk drink absolutely because When you walk into Mexico, Lindo, you are greeted by one of the coolest and busiest bars that you'll see at at a relatively small dining establishment. A little semicircle bar. Semicircle bar. And they got a really cool elevated seating area, like right to the right of it. I want to eat there one time. We need a party of six or more to eat there. Yeah, like that booth, that rounded booth right next to the bar. That's Mm -hmm. where I want to be. Yeah. So everybody needs to come see us. Exactly. (laughs) But and, and they have everything. It's a full bar, so anything that you might want. But if you're going there, they do have some specialty drinks, uh, specifically margaritas, of course. I love the, the Patron margarita. They, they, oh, they it's do ma- That's not typically a tequila that I'm going to say, yeah, put a mixer in that. But you know what? That one is really good because it's all fresh. Yeah, but I will say, yeah, it's fresh, and they, they are not heavy-handed with the mix. Right. You can still enjoy the tequila in that. Yeah, that one, I, I was shocked at how much I liked that one. So, so good pick. But we're not going that that direction. No, this we week. did not this time. We've had that margarita in the past. Yeah. But, so that's kind of a bonus tip if you're in the mood for a cocktail. Indeed. But we went the route of beer. We did. And we wanted to do this because you may not be making your way down to Cape Coral in the near future, though you should. So we're just saying, yes, and I know we've just talked about all this food that you need to come eat with us, but we also know that temperatures are climbing across the United States and wherever you guys may be listening to us, unless you're in the Southern hemisphere, in which case temperatures are dropping Yeah, because you guys are going to start winter soon, (laughs) but regardless, turn the heat up and and have a cold one because we're going to talk about a cold, delicious beer. Oh, and this is one that should be pretty accessible to most everybody i think it's pretty readily available anywhere you go just about and what we're talking about is one that we discovered while actually out doing a disney race in california that is true that's where we first had it Mm, and we featured that place sabroso featured that place but not the beer but not the beer so here we are making up for it on cinco de mayo with modelo Negra. Yes. Modelo makes a number of different beers and they make some other drinks called, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, they're cheladas. Which I want to try, actually. They do look interesting, but we're specifically talking about the darker of 
their two main offerings. And I like their lighter offering. Yes, their lighter offering is a traditional Mexican pilsner Mm -hmm. or lager. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is a slightly darker variant Mm, on that. I love it. You want to drop some technical knowledge on this? I love it so, so much. So... This is a medium-bodied lager with slow roasted caramel malts that is brewed that is brewed to prove (laughs) that is brewed to prove dark beer can deliver both flavor and refreshing taste. Brewed longer to enhance the flavors, the Munich Dunkel style lager gives way to rich flavor and remarkably smooth taste. Modelo Negra contains. Water, barley malt, non-malted cereals, and hops. And that's from their website. And that's from their website. Yes. And now the German style Dunkel. Let me. This is this is a little bit of additional knowledge. If I could drop a little, a little. Yeah, because tr- people are like Dunkel. What is that? Knowledge hand grenade here, or at least I was. This uh, style of beer in particular is called a German style Dunkel. Dunkel is a bottom fermented lager style beer. The word Dunkel is German for dark, and this dark beer style offers beer lovers balanced flavors of chocolate, bread crust, and caramel. Mm. The Dunkel is a classic German lager that craft brewers are fond of brewing, and countless people across the world are fond of enjoying. I love that definition. That's from Mm craftbeer.com. I love that definition because that really, in my opinion encapsulates the flavors that you get from this beer yes it's 5.4 percent abv as i recall the the uh bitterness units are really low 16 16 ibus so really more about the bready malty notes than less about the hoppy bitter notes Mm -hmm. not hoppy not bitter the caramel flavors are just the the hint of the sweetness but not overly sweet and they complement a Mexican meal very well. Yes. The body of the beer, I think, is very light yeah. in terms of the body. It looks dark. It looks like it would be a heavier beer than it is. Mm-hmm. It looks dark, and based on the descriptions and knowledge that we've been sharing from various websites with you today on the episode, you would think it's really super dark, but it's not. Um, it's not super dark. You can you can see through it a oh, little bit. You when can it's see in the through class. it, yeah. and it's lighter in body. Mm-hmm. And I love the carbonation behind it. This has this is a medium to high carbonation beer. I think it pairs wonderfully with spicy food. Yeah, and it's at Mexico Lindo. It is served on tap, on tap, and with a lime. Yes. A, a lot of uh, Mexican restaurants here in the U.S. serve limes with their Mexican-style lagers. Mm-hmm. Um, Modelo is no exception. So if you get a Corona or a Modelo here, you, a lot of times you're going to get that. Yeah. And they do that here as well. But I, I think it goes well. I think so, too. Now, I, we are kind of the oddballs. We do like to squirt the lime right in the beer and yeah. and, and just go to town. Yeah. But I think this is one of the... Best hot weather spicy food beers that you could have, period. And if you were in a hot weather climate mm. or you're vacationing somewhere and you're mm. looking for maybe you've you've rented a place here in Cape Coral or you've you've gotten a a timeshare down in Naples. Sure. And you're looking to stock your fridge with something. This is something that you could run to your local grocery store. And get a you would case, find, and you'd find, and be able to buy very by the, readily probably available by the case. Mm-hmm. Would you get it again? Hundred percent. You know the answer. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I got the, for lack of a better word, jumbo size. I believe it's called a grande. Was it called a grande? I believe so. I call it a jumbo size. Not to be confused with a venti. <laughs> that's that's coffee. No. This and it lasted the whole meal. Oh, yes. And it was so refreshing. And, and I love the way they served it in the humongous mug. 
this particular restaurant loves the giant uh, glass beer mugs yes. and they, they chill them. A lot of people don't like the chilled mugs. Mm. We do. In this particular instance, it just completes the experience. So, yeah, the, yes. the beer purists out there wouldn't like that. But, no. But, oh, no. But you're coming in to from the hot weather in to have a spicy Mexican meal in celebration of a great run or Cinco de Mayo or just because you want to eat well. This is the way to get it. Oh, you know, I think it would be a great Mother's Day meal. What yes, we have shared as well. I, I would agree. That yeah. actually would be a great place for Mother's Day. Yeah. So uh, I vote yes on all counts for the food, for the beverage. And if you are correct, if you just want to stock your fridge with a great darker beer that is going to be great in hot weather, this is it. Absolutely. So Check it out. We will have a link in the show notes to their website so you can learn a little bit can more. Can I say great about that beer any other anymore? It is. It, great like two or three times in the same sentence. But it is. That's the thing. It is it is so light, crisp, refreshing. <laughs> it's got good flavor, but it's not overpowering. And it would go with whether you're doing a plate of, of nachos, mm-hmm. uh, a big entree, or if you were to you know cross the streams and have something more like a, a traditional american meal and you're having like maybe a burger this would be a oh, great yeah. burger beer for yeah i just it's great so check That's, it out See, there it is again there it is again there it is again so check it out we will have a link in the show notes for that and that is going to do it for the drink segment <sighs> of our show this has been an amazing episode what a great capstone to you know uh, for the interview i mean we put a a so honored phenomenal meal on the end of uh, just yeah that's a that's a once in a lifetime interview that we got to share i hope we get her back then it would be a twice in a lifetime interview yeah and she did say that she'd be willing so let's go for. stay tuned we'll let you know yeah Make sure you follow us in Apple Podcasts. Yes, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we <laughs> before we uh, wrap up. Uh, we did um, last week's episode. Uh, we oh. ended up having to do a repost mm-hmm. uh, because items were not showing up in Apple Podcasts. If you use the Apple Podcasts app, you should be seeing now up to episode one sixty four. And you'll see that episode 162 has the word repost mm-hmm. after it. We were trying everything that we could in the in the troubleshooting process with them. It appears that it was a, a widespread issue, issue. with podcasters. Known issue. I, I heard back from support. Yeah. Yeah. So we appreciate your patience if you ended up getting a double dose of that episode downloaded to your device. It. Yeah. But um, that appears to have worked itself out now. The engineers over there they're fixed it but um check out if you didn't catch the first interview with Catherine. the first part of it is just a great story of her run in 1967 at boston amazing so check that out so that's the housekeeping i had is this that that's the reason for the repost and and Thank you guys for And for now doing our that. virtual get well card should be in there with Jeff. And it, it is. Yeah. But we would appreciate it since, especially now that Apple has changed their app over yeah. there on Apple Podcasts. If you would head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a rating and review. First, make sure you're following us. Yes, it's no longer called subscribing over there. It's called following. It's called following. So follow us. Follow us, if you will, and give us a rating and review. So that we can help grow our Runcation Nation. Yeah. More recent and um, positive reviews help us the most. Yeah. So if you haven't done one in a while and you want to jump back in there and do another, we'd appreciate oh, it. Oh, please. Yes. And if you haven't done one at all, we'd really appreciate it. So mm-hmm. please do. And thank you all so much for listening this week. We really do appreciate it. Um, whether it's your long run, your commute to work, around the house, or wherever you are, we really appreciate you listening to the show. I'm your host, Amy. And I'm your co-host, Dana. Stay safe, stay well, 
and we will accomplish, explore, and indulge with you really soon. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Run, Eat, Drink podcast. We're having another great year thanks to your support. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're at Run, Eat, Drink podcast. And on Twitter, we're Run, Eat, Drink pod. You can also give us a call at 941-677-2733 or send us an email at info at runeatdrink.net. Visit our website at runeatdrink.net and click on the subscribe link so you don't miss a minute. Find out how you can support the show at patreon.com slash runeatdrinkpodcast. Accomplish, explore, and indulge right along with us. We'll talk to you next time.